gentlemen or friends. Welcome to this session on virtual worlds we want. I am Mia Petra Kumpulanatri. I am a member of the European Parliament. Uh, I am from Finland. I want to personally and then also on behalf of my uh, colleagues, the uh, European Parliament members, to thank the hosting ministry, Japan, for organizing excellent surroundings for the IGF uh, this year in, in Kyoto. Uh, also, I want to thank Pierre Sodonoho, who is sitting next to me from the European Commission for initiating and organizing this session. It will be uh, very interesting to talk with the panelists that we have here and also audience online and audience here, participants. You have opportunity for the last uh, 20, 25 minutes to participate to questioning uh, these experts that we have uh, got together here. We are uh, some on place and two uh, experts joining us online and also audience online is welcome to join. There is a moderator helping us with the reaching your questions if you have any. So looking the uh, future, uh, looking at what is today, we are already talking about the metaverse, virtual worlds, uh, however you want to name it. It has been a long time something to think of, but now uh, it is getting real possibility along the technological developments. There are uh, imagination of the good healthcare, education, design, whatever uh, virtual, virtual worlds could bring on the logistics, engineering, manufacturing. What goes first? Or is it in the end that it's the games and virtual culture that flowers? Is it then uh, shops, online shopping having the shape? Is it helping us to teach, learn, visit, experience? Actually, it, what we know that it will have an impact on how its citizens will interact with the digital environment, but also within. And when citizens and people meet with each other, it leads to me various also that how we interact. So, is it emphasizing the lessons we have learned with internet, two-dimensional internet, that not everything is easy and good, even if it is uh, vital for everyone to be uh, able to join? So I think we can aim for the open and stable and free virtual worlds to be inclusive and, and global. If it's not interoperable, is it that, that some people go to the other verse and some people stay in this universe. So uh, how to make it reliable and secure and, and uh, what is needed from the technological environment? Is there enough uh, networks to be able to carry this computer power in the hands of you or is it a global effort to do things together? So me as a politician, I have more questions. I hope that the panel will give, guide us uh, forward and, and set the face uh, and then uh, frameworks for what is needed that we can go together for the something better, uh, enlightening more the uh, good sides and possibilities and avoiding some risks that might come. One risk being that we are uh, splittering our existence and not enjoying the common um, internet on the virtual world then based on this one. I see my notes also as a politician mentioning taxis. How to tax anything is everything is online or in virtual worlds. Then the governments come with the ideas of financing too. And then criminalities. Are there some uh, laws in order to police forces and justice systems to find the guilty? And, and, and judge. So with these opening remarks, I give the floor for the first speaker, who's uh, Piers O'Donoghue, Director of the Future Networks in the European U Commission. Piers, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll start again. Thank you very much, Mia Petra, for your support. Um, and thank you for everyone who's here to participate and online. Because discussing here today the, the virtual worlds we want, it's, it's particularly timely. In fact, we are at a critical juncture. Most of the technologies that underpin virtual worlds 
which we know perhaps individually and, and separately, virtual reality, extended reality, AI, of course, but also the underpinning technologies, cloud, Internet of Things, Internet technologies, even high-performance computing, as well as the infrastructure and devices. They have all reached a high level of uh, development, with perhaps the exception of AI, but we see how fast that is happening. But for the metaverse, for virtual worlds, we're still at the dawn of this transition. Uh, and hence, we have the chance to set the guardrails, to set a framework for what is happening. It's also particularly important to discuss the subject here at the IGF, as the governance of virtual worlds is a crucial element to be defined now, since the whole internet governance community is engaged in the debate of the future of the internet governance architecture, with everything that's been going on here about the Global Digital Compact and WISIS. And one of the obvious challenges uh, where we need to support the IGF is in relation to its role in and response to new technologies, such, of course, as artificial intelligence, but also virtual worlds. From the point of view of the European Union, we set out our vision and strategy for the future web just in July, when the Commission adopted a new strategy on an initiative on Web 4.0 and virtual worlds. And that was to give us a head start in the next technological transition. And that allowed us uh, to make some policy uh, proposals rather than any definitive solutions, following a round of consultations with our stakeholders, from industry to academia and civil society. And it is crucial in the context of the IGF to note that that is a process which we wish to continue in the course of setting these guardrails for the metaverse. Importantly, we also held citizens' panels to hear directly from people what opportunities and challenges they see in this significant shift and also how they should be supported, how governments and others should support them and steer the transition to virtual worlds in the right direction. The strategy has a long-term perspective, and as I said, it is also in the context of Web 4.0, which might risk for some, certainly not in this community, but for others, be a bit techy. But the virtual worlds will be an important manifestation of Web 4.0 from the point of view of the normal user as well as business. And beyond the tech jargon, this is really working on a wider, deeper technological transition which will allow a seamless connection between people and the machines that they are using. It will be more Im immersive, but that will deeply impact the way we work, interact and socialize. Our strategy in the Commission is anchored in the idea that developments towards Web 4.0 and virtual worlds must reflect EU values and principles. They must also, of course, respect existing EU legislation to ensure that individuals, people are safe, confident and empowered where people's rights as users, consumers, workers or creators are respected. And this is why there's also continuity in the policies that we have followed recently have all been geared to ensuring a human-centric internet. And that is also the case for virtual worlds. We're really aiming at creating and supporting uh, a, a, and a nurturing environment for the European industry where businesses can develop world-leading applications, scale up and grow, but with certainty about what are the guardrails, what are the principles that they must respect in, 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 in making that work, making the investments in the technology. A another element, and again, this is not new, it, the question is how do we apply it in this case, is ensuring that virtual worlds, the technology and services, the environment, are open and interoperable, to ensure that they won't be, the virtual worlds will not be dominated by a small number of big players, and that people and businesses are able to control the transfer of their data, virtual assets and identities, as the avatars and identities become an even more important part of this process. Our strategy also looks at what are the EU strengths. We obviously have a, a culture-rich continent with a lot of extraordinary cultural heritage which is being or has to be dig digitized. We have industrial players in core enabling technologies. We have major companies, but also innovative SMEs, all of who can play a role. Uh, and where we have made significant investments in fostering data spaces, digital twins, uh, etc., which will actually be an element that feeds into the operation of 
the virtual world in a trustworthy and secure manner. We can also count on a solid future-proof legislative framework in place to ensure that the users are protected and that SMEs can benefit from, from, from this world as well. But there is an outreach element to this and where we hope to learn from and work with global partners who are of course facing the exact same challenges uh, because we have a lot to learn and like so many other elements uh, of the internet we want to ensure that it, it, it actually increases interoperability and openness and does not become a tool for marginalization or fragmentation. We want to empower people and reinforce the skills required to develop innovative applications, services and content. We want to support uh, a web 4.0 industrial ecosystem to scale up excellence in research and development, to foster innovation and to prevent fragmentation within our single market. We want to support societal progress and the provision of virtual public services. It's not all about gaming, after all. Uh, we are going to have two new public flagships in the area of smart cities and in health, respectively. And they are areas, of course, that directly impact on the quality of life of citizens. And then the last pillar, uh, leaning on all of the other three, and what I've already mentioned, is about the governance at global level, but also, of course, EU level, on how we shape global standards for open and interoperable virtual worlds and Web 4.0, and to promote, of course, those standards in line with EU's vision and values. We're already seeing signs, as Mia Petra was also speaking to me about earlier on, about attempts to preempt that standardization process for purposes which we would be deeply suspicious of, uh, and also which would not provide the guarantees with regard to the protection of the individual, protection of identities and the protection of data along line, the lines of the values that we try to be consistent about in all of our actions with regard to digital technologies. So standardization is key and the governance of the metaverse is and will be key. So today we're, we're going to discuss what, what are the virtual worlds we want, what should they look like, but also if we can agree on a common set of principles and values underpinning the virtual worlds, it's perhaps even more important then to discuss how, how do we deliver that, the elements we need to deliver on a certain vision of virtual worlds. And if that can come from the IGF, it automatically has validity, it has strength, and should be a common tool that we can use with partners who are not necessarily present here as a common view uh, of what the uh, metaverse should be shaped like. And as I said earlier, from, from the EU side, we want to ensure that they're designed to be open and not interoperable, uh, and also to enable true user empowerment and diverse participation. So we have to have a look again at the capacity, the ability, the feasibility of access and use by others who are not properly connected, do not have the means to allow the latest um, uh, whiz-bang set of, 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 of goggles that have just been announced, but where basic uh, accessibility and connectivity issues are still a major challenge to, to, towards the uptake of such technologies. That requires innovation, creativity, but also, of course, collaboration. And addressing the governance at global level will be required to achieve openness and interoperability, and it will be key to future developments and uses. Otherwise, elements of society and elements of government will simply shut down on the whole process to the, the detriment we feel of society and the economy. International engagement is needed on things like content, on practice, uh, also of course uh, avoiding, ensuring that there is not disinformation, also that there is not censorship, having a, a, a possible a positive impact on that tension uh, with freedom of speech uh, while protecting the individual. And of course, surveillance versus privacy, where we have to ensure the, the protection of the individual. So of course, I think in this community, there will be very little doubt that we are all committed to engaging in this multi-stakeholder internet governance, uh, in the design of an open and interoperable virtual world. Again, the question is, how do we convince others to do the same? To develop human rights-based virtual worlds, we have to rely on the recognized instruments. 
We have in Europe the European Declaration on Digital Rights and Principles, uh, as well as a Declaration for the Future of the Internet. And we know that these are mirrored by actions and views and principles held in other areas, uh, because that Declaration for the Future of the Internet, as we discussed here on Sunday, already has almost 70, 70 signatories, including in the Global South. Um, of course, governance, governance for openness and interoperability can only be accomplished by this community. I repeat that point and we will not stop saying it. But it is also important that as we rely on the IETF, on ICANN, and on other uh, important bodies, we must ensure that the IGF is at that same level, being allowed to play its role, and that national and regional initiatives, uh, including regional internet governance fora, for multi-stakeholder internet are allowed to have their input to that important technical and policy process. So we are launching for our part in Europe an expert group which will bring our member states together with others to share a common approach in the best practices on the virtual worlds. As I said, in line with the consultation process that we are running, we want to set with the community and with member states the guidelines for this important technological process. We will support the creation of a technical multi-stakeholder governance process to address essential aspects of virtual worlds uh, that are uh, perhaps not sufficiently elaborated so far in, in the global institutions, the governance institutions so far. So we must look at how we deal with this issue in the IGF and we have to address it positively and critically. What is it that the IGF needs to do? What support, for example, do governments need to give to the IGF to engage in the intercessional work to ensure that it is the locus for this discussion. I hope that today's discussion will contribute significantly to our dialogue on the role of the multi-stakeholder governance model for virtual worlds, and that will help us in our work, but help others also, and bring us together in a common understanding from the outset about how do we achieve true user empowerment, diverse participation, and accessibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We only got one hour, 15 minutes to solve the, the, the questions or the <laughs> elaborate at least the, the skinner read that the commission was uh, giving us from uh, Europe, for European uh, Commission. So uh, next I go for the experts that we have uh, gathered here together. Uh, I will put the plenary to talk about uh, like uh, three big titles, <coughs> regulation and governance. Then the accessibility and inclusivity, and then the third, interoperability and standards. But I let the experts to have their own vision, uh, not entitledly only for this title. Uh, three, four minutes each. And we will start with uh, Kathy Lee. Kathy Lee is with us online. She's the head of AI, Data and Metaverse at the World Economic Forum with the vast uh, knowledge and experiment on the businesses on uh, VPP Media Investment Arm including digital media buying and, and real professional who has been working in London, New York and Beijing. Kathy, are you with us? I would like yes. to have your comment. What would be needed to support such an, a vision we heard here, open, interoperable, safe, uh, good uh, governance? Is it legislative? What institutions? Please, word is yours. <laughs> Thank you, moderator. Um, and uh, good to see everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the online uh, audience as well. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, so my name is Kathy Lee. I head the AI data and metaverse work um, and the co-head of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the forum, working on the forum. So first of all, um, I do wanted to mention that um, indeed at the forum, we have been covering the, the topic of the metaverse, virtual worlds and web 4.0 for probably the longest time since, uh, of, um, since I think before October 2021. Uh, and that was important because that was before uh, even Meta changed their, their brand name. Um, so you can imagine that we've been uh, working on this issue for the for, for the longest period. Um, but the, the, the ambition at that time was really to anticipate the global discussions on the metaverse and virtual worlds. That's how we launched the Defining and Building the Metaverse Initiative 
to basically realize the benefits, uh, mitigate the risks uh, of virtual worlds and Web uh, 4.0. And the initiative really intends to surface uh, technology and policy harmonization needs, uh, explores and guides the economic impact and use case uh, development, and co-design the kind of necessary frameworks for responsible uh, deployment. Uh, what we did was we leveraged the kind of peer-to-peer cross-sectoral -sect collaboration uh, and managed to convene a community of more than 300 experts from across the public and private sectors to generate socially useful, inclusive, equitable, and responsible uh, virtual worlds. The work um, uh, cuts uh, across two tracks, value creation um, and governance. And value creation, we're talking about not just about creating value for the industry, but most importantly for the society um, overall as well. The initiative advances recommendations on topics such as the digital identity, ethics, IP rights, and digital um, assets. The value creation track really maps out the new value chains and business model across industries, uh, identifying potential use cases future use cases while analyzing the impacts and the risks of uh, virtual worlds to society and culture. The governance track recommends policy frameworks for the global um, and responsible technology deployment while championing uh, equity, inclusion, diversity, and uh, accessibility. So far, the initiative have produced work on uh, demis uh, demystifying the consumer metaverse, uh, social implications of the metaverse, interoperability in the metaverse, and privacy and safety in the metaverse. Uh, next, the initiative will focus on uh, developing guidance on uh, metaverse industry transformation, identity, and, and security. Ultimately, uh, the initiative will provide guidance, uh, provide a guidance, uh, a, a gov governance uh, framework for the virtual worlds and web 4.0. Um, and here it's very important to First of all, talk about the definition of the metaverse. We at the forum never thought this would be limited to a 2D or 3D AR, VR, XR kind of virtual environment. It's important to think of the metaverse as the future, as the, the next iteration of the internet. Um, and what kind of economic and social uh, opportunities we wanted to generate from the next iteration of the internet. And equally, what kind of guardrails we wanted to put in place. Um, and if we uh, walk back from that vision, what do we need to do today to make sure that we have the kind of future that everyone can benefit from? So I do want to uh, address very briefly on uh, your first question in terms of how do we make sure that there's uh, international engagement from the multi-stakeholder community? Because again, that's been what we, we, we have been doing for the past two years, and it's not an easy process. Because in a, in a borderless metaverse, the only way to mitigate the risks of regulatory arbitrage um, and secure individuals' data and rights is to develop uh, global governance solutions. But we still uh, are seeing a significant lack of uh, harmonization across jurisdictions. For example, a study conducted in 2021 by the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation discovered that 62 countries currently have uh, um, prohibitions or limitations in place regarding the flow of data across their borders. Furthermore, the, the data which um, these restrictions are being implemented is increasing. This underscores the importance of international collaboration that spans borders to both streamline and safeguard the movement of data, which is a critical uh, consideration as the borderless metaverse continues to develop. Those who collaborate across borders must continue to take into account the ethical, uh, jurisdictional, and coordination challenges related to uh, two key factors. One is the new types of data and their uh, associated definitions. And two, emerging forms of uh, social interactions linked to uh, embodiment and presence. Uh, moreover, given the, the net new uh, natures of several um, metaverse technologies and experiences, it's likely that the new governance solutions, both legal and non-legal, will need to be developed and, 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 tr uh, and trialed across jurisdictions to be able to effectively govern uh, virtual worlds. 
And to facilitate this process, we need uh, multi-stakeholder bodies developing principles and frameworks on adverse governance, standard setting uh, organizations working to ensure technologies are open and interoperable, and government engagement in the rule setting and um, uh, enforcement process, and the strong uh, industry buy-in, which will be, uh, be key as well. Uh, I'll stop there and very happy to continue the discussion uh, later on, but that, that will be my, uh, some of my initial observations. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will deep dive into some uh, questions more. Uh, next, uh, I will have the pleasure to ask Elena Plexida, who's the Vice President of, uh, of, for the Government of uh, IGO Engagement in the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. Uh, prior joining ICAM, she works for the European Commission too, but has been then uh, championing this our common in internet in ICAM names and numbers. Does it uh, apply in the metaverse? Having the premise that it's a global phenomenon, it needs global governance as also challenged here. What we can learn from the systems? Could we draw parallels from the governance model that ICAM is now running? Thank you, Mia Petra. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, indeed, um, ICANN coordinates the internet unique identifiers, the names, the numbers, the protocols, and especially the names, the domain name system. Um, it's a coordination with what, without which you wouldn't have uh, the global internet, the global internet as we know it today. Um, and we do not do that alone, it's a family of technical organizations. ICANN bring to, brings together a global community that includes all stakeholders across the spectrum, government, civil society, academia, engineers, users, and they collectively make the policies that govern the domain name system. That's the ICANN multi-stakeholder model, if you will. Uh, and all our sibling technical organizations, like the ITF that Piers mentioned before, have their own multi-stakeholder multi governance model. It's, um, if you will, multi-stakeholderism at its core. Um, we are not just talking about participation or international engagement, we are talking about decision making that in the case of the ICANN uh, multi-stakeholder model, it can change things like the very root of the internet. Um, this governance model has enabled and has protected the global internet so far, the technical layer that keeps the internet together, that's what I mean by the internet. To your question about the whether we can draw parallels, um, the first remark I'd like to make is that this multi-stakeholder model has worked very well for the internet for the last 25 minutes, uh, 25 years. <laughs> it would be fantastic. Huh? <laughs> it should work <laughs> as well for the next 25 years. minutes. <laughs> so it, it, it absolutely must be preserved uh, to govern the technical underpinnings of the internet so they can continue to support anything that comes on top of them in the future, uh, be it virtual worlds, be it web four, five, be it five, uh, be whatever inflated version of the web anyway. Um, now, if we were talking about virtual worlds in a closed environment, gaming, um, this would be an application issue and we wouldn't be discussing much. However, the virtual worlds are meant to integrate with the real world or with each other, um, with day-to-day -day interaction with the real world. Um, and that's what the European Commission communication is aiming to, to discuss, it's a, this augmented reality. So then the question becomes, how do you keep in sync the virtual and the real world? Um, and how do you keep in sync the real world with many virtual worlds? Um, when you go into the metaverse um, in a virtual browser or virtual computer and type www.icon.org, where do you go? I think Piers mentioned that before as a, as a question. Uh, or how about property? Uh, how does a property how does a property belong to? Who, who does it belong to? Uh, what are the different obligations that are tied to that property in the many different worlds, as an example? So then you are indeed into a governance issue. Now, the real world, take for example real estate, is heavily regulated by sovereign governments. Stakeholder participate by providing views. They're being consulted. The governance system that supports the internet technically, as I explained before, does not work that way. Stakeholders, including governments along with the other stakeholders, they decide. So the question becomes, as the virtual world and the real world start to integrate, 
what happens at the juncture uh, in terms of governance? Um, clearly, I don't have the answer. <laughs> Uh, except to say that we do need everyone around the table globally. You do need multi-stakeholderism. Um, but I can certainly say that you cannot have a stable and secure internet without the same in the virtual worlds. So although the virtual worlds might be long uh, way out, we do have to start thinking about it. And uh, thanks to the European Commission for putting the questions out there. Thank you so much. Um, then about the how to make this uh, world of accessibility and, and take inclusivity on board, responsible innovation and so. So next couple of speakers will touch that. Uh, I will first have His uh, Excellency, a global technocrat with a driver's experience in business. Uh, also being a professor on entrepreneurship of the University of Nairobi Business School worked for the Ministry of Information and Communi Communication and now as a Kenya's ambassador to Belgium and the EU. So welcome, uh, Bitanya and Demo. Floor is yours. Thank you for the question. Um, the issue about accessibility um, and the word multi-stakeholder uh, needs to be reconciled. Sometimes I say uh, we need to define these concepts ahead of time so that everybody understands. Uh, if you look at uh, the road infrastructure, the government uh, does it and we all use it. We compete within that space. Uh, and if it were that every rich person makes the road, uh, we would have a lot of problems, even in terms of competition. Accessibility and uh, inclusivity would begin with uh, who builds the infrastructure because some or those who go ahead building this infrastructure create problems uh, of access in such a way that competition can lower the cost of entry. So if we are uh, serious about this, um, we must uh, rein in on some of those who participate in the multi-stakeholder arrangement to create access to these technologies and be able to do what some countries have done, which build infrastructure and everybody rides on it like we do on the road infra in infrastructure. Uh, by understanding that uh, everything is changing, uh, we are uh, uh, if I talk about education, um, we begin fast. Every learning is predicated on some theory or philosophy. We spend on Plato's uh, philosophies of learning. Uh, most of us learned through uh, rote learning, uh, memorization, and then uh, people like uh, Pavlov in dog experimentation changed into behaviorism. And uh, we moved out of there. Biaget came with constructivism, which has done a lot of uh, good across the world, which countries uh, changed the way of learning. This is now shifting. It shifted into what we call connectivism, where internet came and people are learning in certain ways. Uh, the trouble is that because of lack of access, not everybody enjoyed that space. We are shifting now into metaverse, where uh, I am hoping that academicians would say we are in augmentation or, or, or augmentative uh, stage or theory that would explain our learning. If you see uh, the growth of virtual reality across the world, even in, in Africa, which usually comes from behind, you are seeing solutions which would amaze you. But these solutions must be accessible and inclusive across the board. To get them to be accessed and uh, address everybody's uh, problems, uh, a number of things has to be done from what has been said by previous speakers and also embracing new ways um, of creating 
new spaces of competition by destroying the structures that we have had before. Um, it is the most, uh, what is happening now is the most defining moment of our time uh, with these technologies. Uh, unless something is done now, we are going to mess up a lot of people's lives uh, who may not access that, who may not be as competitive as I told you. Some of us begin through memorization to this stage. Others would be <laughs> in the augmentation. Uh, one example I will give you, in my biology class, my teacher used to draw an apple on the board and a plus in the middle and will tell us this is the left ventricle and the right ventricle of the heart. And you're trying to imagine what the hell is the heart look like. Now, if you look uh, virtual uh, um, immersive learning, you see the heart, you see where it is, you see how the blood flows. And you can actually walk out of there and explain to someone, uh, if we deny young people, that opportunity to learn in ways that they understand content beyond uh, what we have seen before. Uh, we are doing ourselves a, a disservice. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, and I, my family comes from the far north Lapland, and they really thought when the internet came and now that you distance might lose meaning and they have more opportunities to, as you described very beautifully. Next one uh, we will have from the Project Liberty Institute, which is describing its aims as uh, enhanced ethical governance of the future uh, businesses and, and, and technology. The Paul Fenninger, please, how do we foster responsible innovations? Foster innovation, but make it responsible at the same time in the world of words. Thank you so much. Um, um, first of all, I just want to say that um, in all the interventions um, of, of the two of you and, 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 and my fellow um, um, discussants, I sense a lot of aspiration uh, when we talk about virtual worlds. Um, and this is why I think the title, The Virtual World We Want, is, is, is very wisely chosen. Um, my name is Paul Fellinger. I'm the Director of Policy, Governance, Innovation, and Impact of Project Liberty. Um, as you said, we're an organization for responsible innovation, ethical governance of new emerging and sometimes disruptive technologies, um, such as um, everything involved in, in Web3, Web4. Um, we, as an organization, do basically three things. Um, we enable evidence-based um, governance innovation through our research partnerships. Um, our founding partners are Stanford University, uh, in Silicon Valley, Sciences Po in, in, in Paris and France and Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. And we catalyze multi-stakeholder cooperation to develop governance frameworks for responsible innovation and ethical technology. And um, very particular, we also are the steward um, of an open source public internet, uh, public interest protocol for the internet, which is called DSMP, the Decentralized Social Networking Protocol, which is a protocol to enable user data control, interoperability between services, and economic value participation. And um, thank you for the question on how to, to um, do responsible innovation practice, because this is what we focus on. We're currently leading together with the Aspen Digital Institute, um, a global multi-stakeholder initiative for ethical principles for responsible technology. It's a global consultative process. We had um, regional consultations already in Latin America and Costa Rica in the past months. We were in Africa and in, in, in Nairobi uh, um, just before the summer. Uh, we had consultations in Europe, in Paris. Um, we had here consultations in Japan on the sidelines of the Internet Governance Forum. In three weeks, we will hold our North American consultations in Silicon Valley. And um, we have already consulted with over 200 key actors across international organization, policy makers, businesses, investors, entrepreneurs, civil society, and academics um, to precisely ask the question of what is responsible innovation with virtual worlds, new technologies. And I want to share four takeaways without preempting um, the process and the final results, which will um, released for, for public comments in, 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 in December towards the end of the year. One first takeaway is that we need to look at the entire innovation cycle for, for responsible innovation. 
a lot of efforts in the past, uh, iterations of the web have been focused on regulation. But the innovation cycle also is how we design and develop technology, how technology is funded, how we do investment, which is something that was already mentioned, um, how it's commercially deployed, and then how it's regulated. And I want to just say congratulations to the approach um, of the European Union, because this initiative looks really very early in the innovation cycle. We basically discuss an upcoming innovation that is more of a concept today than a market reality for lack of computing power and, and, and other factors at this moment. So um, there is also this opportunity to learn from the iterations of Web 1 and Web 2, as Peer said in the beginning, and have a better approach for Web 3, Web 4. We are here in Japan. So Japan is talking about society 5.0, whatever number of an iteration you want to you wanna give it. Um, the second takeaway um, that we have heard so far from, from, from this initiative is that ethical governance is sort of a journey. Um, yes, there are overarching high-level principles and frameworks. And yes, existing rules apply also in the, in the metaverse and virtual worlds. But with the confluence with this mix of multiple technologies, artificial intelligence, XR, blockchain, quantum computing power in the future, neurotechnology when we integrate not only the visual but also computer brain interfaces in, in the interactions, th this is certainly having unintended consequences that we don't even know today. So a risk-based approach works very well um, when you know um, what, <laughs> what you're dealing with, but here we did, this is uncertainty. Um, so what we've been hearing a lot is that we need a process-oriented approach and, and this requires a mindset shift, a cultural shift um, that says, well, uncertainty is part of the game, so how do we make it work? And here again, I think um, a lot of thinking has already been going in a very good direction towards more agile governance approaches that um, build on sandboxes that allow for experimentation and testing and for iteration and for multi-stakeholder partnerships, but it's very important, and this is also something that was said over and over again, that multi-stakeholder partnerships and multi-stakeholder involvement for responsive innovation need to have teeth. Um, there needs to be some form of enforcement at the end of feedback loops. Um, a third takeaway, and this was highlighted, we had a town hall of Project Liberty yesterday, and um, something that was highlighted by quite a few people um, during this session was, the economic dimension of making responsible innovation work. In the, pers in the case of Europe, we want um, that Europe's virtual worlds are competitive. So how can you be at the same time responsible and compatible, uh, competitive at the global level? Um, because, and this was mentioned already um, before, jurisdictions are different. There are different standards around the world. Um, so there need to be economic incentives. It needs to make good business sense to behave responsibly. And this is a discussion we need to have. And last, but definitely not least, and this is one of the most important points, I would even say, when we discuss virtual worlds, the notion that regulation is very important, but as we look around the entire innovation cycle, um, we also need to look at the technological dimension and to see how ethics can be embedded by design and technology or through the technological design. Um, code is law and law is code. Um, so what kind of public interest digital infrastructure do we need? Um, how do we build um, um, interoperable infrastructures? And here the question is um, between centralization and decentralization. And I think it's very important to have a discussion with the different stakeholders around the table on do we need a holistic approach because we have learned from Web 1, Web 2, that there was a lot of patching, a lot of piecemeal solutions through regulation. Um, but if we look through the entire stack and we start thinking about the protocol level on which virtual worlds will be based in the, or built in the future, um, we need to discuss if at this infrastructure protocol level we can embed by design certain um, 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 principles such as user data control, such as interoperability, and such as economic value participation, which is something we, which is very close to, to, to us at Project Liberty because we are the steward of one protocol that does exactly that. And there are other approaches as well and, 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 and other initiatives working on similar approaches. And just to finish, and I think this is common sense and, and we all agree, we need a human-centric approach and I just 
want to share something very specific in that regard. We at Project Liberty, we're part of um, the ITU's focus group on the metaverse, where there's a discussion on standards and interoperability. Um, and we are realizing that a lot of the discussions focus on users as consumers. And I think it's very important to slightly shift this mindset as well and talk about how to empower users beyond just being consumers um, of virtual worlds. There are commercial applications, there are industrial applications, there are commercial applications, but virtual worlds will also shift the fabric of connectivity as societies at large. So um, it's important to keep this in mind from the onset. Um, and I look forward to, to, to the discussions. Thank you very much. Actually, you paved the way for the, the three next speakers. Our last round is from the tech business uh, right away. Is there ethical principles on the desk of the engineers doing the R&D on the commercialization phase? How to make it really happen? Are the networks there? We will have the speakers from IOWN, Nokia, and Meta. So first, uh, Dr. Mashi Masahisha Kawashima, who is leading the NTT's R&D of Innovative Optical and Wireless Network, technology director there. So what are the big technological issues we need international standards for? Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, standardization items. For example, uh, we have to update our technology suite for uh, information representation to support 3D digital object for Metaverse. And also, uh, we need to update uh, infrastructure uh, 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 standardization standards to support high capacity and low latency networks for uh, VR and uh, virtual VR and MR uh, applications. But I think these uh, work items are relatively straightforward. And the most uh, complex and challenging issue is how to enforce uh, data privacy and AI governance policies. For example, when I walk in into a shop in the virtual space, before entering the shop, I want to make it sure that my data is protected. So, for example, of course, today we have a server certificate mechanism. So, it is easy to have a shop submit a certificate to attest the compliance with the policies. But I, I cannot be sure if what is attested reflects, really reflects how the server is operated, actually. So, to enforce the policy technically is very difficult. Another example is when I use data from other data providers, I want to be sure that the data is authentic. Of course, we can have a certificate mechanism, but how can we prove, actually, how can I be actually sure that the data is not fake? So such issues, actually, has not yet been solved in today's internet. Internet is a good transport network, but Internet itself cannot guarantee that transported data is not fake when the server, server site is not a fake site. So without that, we need to make the future internet not just for transporting data, but the future internet should be the infrastructure for trusted service and data exchange. And we don't have a, such a technology suite. Uh, but without such technological suite, launching a virtual world may have many people. Uh, that is my uh, view on, on that question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and next one, uh, Tatsuya Yanagishi Bashi from uh, Chief Technology Officer uh, for Japan on Nokia Solutions and Network. I do remember when I've traveled from Finland to the United States and it was cut off my mobile. <laughs> it's peaceful, uh, no uh, virtual reality, no uh, only singing birds. And I was thinking, oh, was it my mobile phone? So what is it the world uh, of standards and, and networks from Nokia perspective? Sure, 
So firstly, thank you very much for inviting. And um, it's a great pleasure to have um, this opportunity to be actually share our view on uh, the metaverse. So, um, so before actually I briefly touch upon uh, kind of the technologies which is, I think, enabling the metaverse to be real, uh, I would also like to briefly touch upon, um, you know, again, the importance of the standard and the standardization efforts. Uh, because I think those two things are still, you know, fundamentally important uh, for you know the building um, interoperable um, virtual environment, virtual world, metaverse, right? And um, from our perspective, uh, we have seen very good uh, the difference in the wireless communication standard that is actually called a 3GPP. So it has uh, developed a wireless communication standard for more than decades, and it has been you know, su so successfully done so far. And, uh, I, and we, Nokia, believe that similar approach also required uh, for the metaverse standard as well. But here, you can also imagine, you know, I think we have a big problem today. There are so many metaverse-related standards in the market today. Um, and uh, there is no uh, 3GPP like uh, the single standard organizations actually, you know, driving the uh, innovations. And um, there are so many, as I said, uh, metaverse related uh, standard organizations. They don't like each other. They ignore each other. <laughs> Sometimes they fight each other. So I don't think this is a kind of ideal um, situations. And we definitely need to have a better uh, governance model here. And uh, from uh, Nokia's point of view, so there are some organizations actually called the Metaverse Standard Forum. So this is a different organizations from the ITU, so you, 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 you just mentioned. So that's another kind of uh, the opportunities we think uh, where we can actually drive interoperable Metaverse Standard. Um, so, and uh, of course, Nokia is part of these organizations. I think this might be probably the better um, environment where we, where we can actually di discuss the metaverse governance. So that's the first comment. And then, you know, next uh, question would be, you know, kind of the technologies to uh, accelerate uh, the metaverse and the virtual world is from Nokia perspective, uh, the Excel device is definitely promising technologies. Um, so um, today, as you can imagine that our communication is like a smartphones, right? This is a majority of uh, user end devices. But in 2030, for example, I think this is no longer the case. We believe that um, extra device has much more, um, you know, it's going to be more dominant uh, in user end device, the market and segments. Uh, but um, today, you can also imagine that uh, extra device available uh, we can use today it's still um, not human friendly you cannot really imagine with using such i think bigger you know extra device for 24 hours right that's obviously impossible uh, it xr extended reality device sorry mm. yeah xr yeah so uh, what network can probably do and help in this situation is you know, today, XR device is having a big, bigger computing processing, but I think network can take care of some of processing at edge, for example, which makes XR device much lighter, uh, you know, having b better, longer um, battery life, and, uh, you know, even cheaper, right? So I think this is where network can actually really help. And um, this needs to be also discussed in, um, I think, metaverse-related uh, standard organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Even we are talking already uh, virtual world, not AI anymore. I was reading the other day of the AI developing uh, machinery to build more chips for AI because they are needing more. So I don't know how quickly they <laughs> introduce themselves to introduce something that they can be built. But then um, now next one, uh, next speaker will be from Brussels, uh, from Meta, Alexandra Gochis. Are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Thank you welcome so much. and welcome to join us and give your perspective as, as the last speaker for the round. My children, I'm uh, 
teasing all the time that have sometimes a book, but the, now there is no more Facebook, there is Meta. Tell us <laughs> where you want to see us in future. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting us to this debate. Uh, good morning from Brussels, of course, good afternoon where you are, and sorry I can't be there in person with you. So, you know, we've been talking a lot today about global governance standards, multi-stakeholder cooperation. You've asked us to weigh, weigh in on that. Of course, these are big concepts to unpack. So I thought what would be maybe helpful to do today is first share with you a little bit more about our vision for this and then give you a couple of examples, specific examples of how we're working on that. Um, so first of all, some of you have uh, referred to the definitions. Uh, we obviously believe that virtual worlds or the metaverse is simply the next chapter or the next evolution of the internet. So, but we think about it as much more embodied and immersive internet with that defining feeling of presence. So obviously like to there's internet, the metaverse is not going to be a single product. It's going to be a constellation of technologies, platforms and products. And obviously it will be built by many different stakeholders. It won't be built by one company alone. There will be developers, creators, civil society involved. And this is uh, obvious but important to stress because we obviously will not be the ones setting the rules for how this works, it will really require a multi-stakeholder effort to bring this to life and truly develop the right norms for it. So from our side, we believe that the metaverse will only reach its full potential if it is built on the foundation of common technical standards. Uh, we talked about empowering consumers and citizens. We talked about empowering businesses. We believe that people need to be able to seamlessly navigate and travel between the multiple platform destinations and experiences that you will have in the metaverse, just like you can browse the, the internet today freely. So this obviously will help create beneficial economic effects. It will favor competition, citizens' choice. Um, so we really, really, really truly believe that this element of interoperability is important here. Of course, not every uh, aspect of the metaverse experience needs to be or will be interoperable with the others, but without the agreement that that baseline interoperability matters to connect the metaverse together, it will very quickly become fragmented and broken into silos. Um, so obviously the development of technical standards in specific areas is crucial to create that baseline level of interoperability. Uh, and essentially we it will make sure that we can mirror the kind of open interest you that are many to everyone dear participants uh, so please raise your hand if you would like to ask I'll question or make comment in q and apart this need to be seamlessly interconnected not gated off and for this to happen successfully the only way it can happen successfully is if we develop these standards in a collaborative fashion so industry governments and experts must come together around these shared technical standards for the metaverse to be truly interoperable and here i wanted to just share a few concrete examples with you i'll share maybe three given the the limits of time that we have uh just to give you um an idea of how we are engaging in some of the, these multi-stakeholder initiatives so the first one was already mentioned by the previous speaker the metaverse standards forum which we joined in 2022 uh, this is an industry-wide effort that brings together leading companies of all sizes together with standards organizations to uh, talk about how to build that open inclusive metaverse and essentially provide space Romy Mans has left the meeting. Romy Mans has joined the meeting. Standards. Um, now, of course, there are others. Cuba's Romani has left the meeting. Economic Forum. Um, we also are involved in the WEFs defining and building the metaverse initiative, which essentially seeks to, to guide the development of a safe, open, and interoperable metaverse. And again, this is a great example of that multi-stakeholder approach to defining the governance frameworks for the metaverse, uh, and we're therefore actively engaging in that effort. And then maybe lastly, the XR Association, which is another forum for cross-industry cooperation. They bring together companies working across the whole spectrum of the metaverse technology. So we're talking about you know, headsets manufacturers, technology platforms, um, to companies that build components and in internet infrastructure and enterprise solutions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really the whole spectrum. Uh, and all of these, the three that I just mentioned, they're very good examples of multi-stakeholder initiatives that really can help feed into that debate on governance we're trying to have to help ensure that metaverse will be accessible to all participants. Now, against that backdrop, backdrop where, 
industry participates and comes together to collaborate on open standards, we, we really think that ideally policymakers would be uh, supporting and embracing those multi-stakeholder efforts to develop baseline technical standards. And very importantly, and this was referred to, I think, uh, to by some of the previous speakers, uh, we really try to encourage as well that European industry participates in these efforts so that they are conceived with European values built in from the start. So, uh, you know, all this to say that aligning any future initiatives with the work of such international multi-stakeholder efforts around technical standards, I believe, will be vital, really vital to ensure that policies of the future really are in line with industry best practices and support responsible innovation globally. And, you know, some of the previous speakers have mentioned it. We, we are years ahead uh, of this becoming a reality. And so we now have the opportunity to develop some of these things in advance. And maybe lastly, uh, I know I'm probably out of time, but I just wanted to mention one more thing, which perhaps would be interesting to bear in mind. Sabrina Heder has left this. the meeting. There is a, a network called the European Metaverse Research Network, which is essentially a body of academics from several European member states. So I think there are universities involved from Germany, France, Poland, Spain, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, etc., who are studying the risks and opportunities of the metaverse. They are examining how metaverse technologies will intersect with issues like privacy, safety, inclusion, future of work. And they're looking at, at sort of the questions of governance as well. So all of this combined, you know, these are, I think, good examples of some of these multi-stakeholder initiatives. And AG Pavelis has joined the meeting. And obviously we from our side uh, are very open to continue discussing this and engaging in any other efforts that are out there. But I thought it would be just helpful to give some very concrete examples of things that we are following and engaging in that, that we see happen to develop those, those common technical standards and government frameworks. Um, I will, I can say a few more things, but I will maybe stop here to allow some time for discussion. Uh, and I just wanted to really thank you for inviting us to this debate and uh, also available for any follow-ups and discussions afterwards for whoever would like to have one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think it's time really to go straight for the questions as we uh, have limited time. But we will keep that part as we promised for 20 minutes. So audience, uh, if we do have questions online, please indicate me from, from the technical secretariat and then anybody in the room who would like to ask questioning. Questions? You can always introduce yourself. Oh, yes, but should we? A microphone is here behind, so you will be seen also. So like in the previous, uh, you can form a line and then have a the floor. But if it's here, then you can be seen on the... So please introduce yourself. Good, good afternoon. Um, I don't know this is on. Okay, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodika Chakina, and I come from the Council of Europe. Um, the Council of Europe is also looking at the metaverse. Of course, we are a human rights organization, so from the point of view of the impact on human rights, rule of law, and democracy. We also organized a session on the metaverse uh, two days ago on, on, on day one, specifically from, again, human rights point of view. So one of the questions, we are also working now on a report that will be issued next year uh, on this with IEEE. And one of the big questions uh, that we have and we're looking at is, of course, governance uh, and uh, the existing instruments. Uh, are the existing instruments sufficient to cover the metaverse considering its complexities, its impact on uh, the brain, on uh, you know, mental autonomy, uh, and, and not only? Um, so, or, or something else will be needed, like, you know, like the new AI treaty we're working on or, or other, you know, acts. So this is the question. Do you think that what we have in place or what other, you know, international organizations have in place um, is, is, is sufficient or um, more needs to be done? <coughs> Taking into consideration uh, what was said before, that the metaverse is still evolving and it's not really possible to anticipate uh, all its applications. Thank you. Thank you. Who from the panel wants to take this one? Maybe I can guess that... Liberty, do you want to answer? 
on this one, and then maybe also uh, Cindy online. With pleasure. I actually had um, um, listening to, to what you said. We are at a stage where we Captain. sort of think there's a huge wave coming. Um, uh, this would be great, um, hopefully, for, for, for our economies, for, for citizens, uh, and enrich our lives and, and, and not be to the detriment um, of it. Uh, mental health and other issues were mentioned as well. So getting this right is a big question. Um, you mentioned you, you run a big initiative as well, um, um, as many organizations who now look at, at, at this topic. And it still takes a year until you will have findings. So we are so early that we are still trying to figure out the basics of how what we have applies, what else needs to be invented. But I just want to highlight something else. Um, at the same time, as we speak here right now, trying to figure this out, and this is what I mentioned with embracing uncertainty, there are engineers working on new things. They are not part of those discussions. They are e not even aware of our efforts here in this room to, to try to get this right. Um, there are entrepreneurs who launch startups. Um, there are investors, um, um, venture capitalists who invest and who take bets on what technology will be mainstream or not. And I just want to highlight that it's incredibly important as we have the luxury basically of having a huge uh, technological development and having champions already who, um, who put this on the map, um, launch big processes. Um, um, if we want to get this right, we need to get early in the innovation cycle, but not when we have figured things out, because the reality is we will not have figured things out. Even if we encode things, probably they will not age so well and they need to be updated at one point. So it's very important, even at a stage where we have not figured everything out, to involve those different communities. Doing so, and this is something that is something we should address in a multi-stakeholder setting, requires speaking a different language because those people have economic incentives or, or technological incentives. They operate at different speeds faster and um, um, we need to find a way to bridge those different silos. And this is really important and there's a chance to, to get this specifically right. Thank you. Kathy, are you online? Do you yeah. want to take this one? Yeah. Uh, I would like to say I wanted to slightly contradict with the previous speaker, which is I wanted to point you to the work we've been doing. We've been doing this for more than two years, and all of those experts from uh, engineers to entrepreneurs, they are part of the existing uh, community already. And um, the right now, the consensus more or less is that Yes, the, the existing laws and regulations, some of them may cover, uh, but many of them, you know, there's a need for the net new regulations to, to come in. And maybe not, maybe regulation isn't the right word, um, but more of a comprehensive governance framework from both the companies and organizations themselves. There needs to be the, the kind of uh, right governance framework put in place but also we need to take a look at what are the net new policies and regulations that, that might be needed. And again, the work we're doing is very comprehensive. Like I said, we already studied the consumer metaverse, industrial metaverse, uh, social implications, identity, privacy, security, and interoperability, covering all the kinds of new data that will be generated, the new technical standards that will be needed across the whole uh, technology uh, stack because this is a, a, a complicated, you know, a future kind of construct of the, the, the internet. I would encourage everyone to really think deep in terms of what exactly we're talking about. Like one of the examples that the earlier um, uh, participant uh, speaker uh, gave in terms of walking to a shop, that itself, that's a very difficult interoperability technical standards issue, because even with let's assume we all have avatars from one place to another, just even the, slight, the slightest um, kind of modification to, to the physical features of that, that, that avatar, that has a different copyright uh, intellectual property issue that's attached to it. So obviously the current copyright laws and, and directives are not going to be sufficient. But at the same time, we also need to be careful about not to use any of the new proposed laws and regulations, for example, the upcoming uh, EU uh, AI Act, to interpret the previous and existing laws and regulations. 
because then we're, we're never going to come to a conclusion in terms of what's actually needed and what needs to be put in place. We do need to go, we, we acknowledge that the technology is evolving um, and it's going to continue to do that. But at the same time, there must be, you know, the kind of uh, relevant and efficient, um, effective kind of uh, protective um, governance framework put in place to protect humans' uh, rights offline and also, also online. But at the same time, looking at what are the potential net new regulations and policies that, that we need to embrace in the future. Thank you. I will give also short uh, comment from uh, uh, Elena, please, from ICANN. Thank you. Just to add up very quickly to what uh, the previous speakers were saying, we need standards in virtual worlds. Uh, but let's remember, internet standards are elective, not normative. So this is where multi-stakeholder model helps to not bring the heavy-handed um, normative standards too early. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, on, on it breaks our imagination. What can avatar do for another avatar when it's all unlawful or when you have adult av avatars acting with the minor avatar? Is the laws complying? Is it only the, something like not nice, something that we find in the school rooms, but we don't want to embrace it in the in the virtual world so lots of lot for the mothers lot for the children a lot for the i mean parents all and all to look at but we have a next uh, question from the from here uh, and then we have one online hello my name is jan hirvonen i'm from the finnish uh, ministry for foreign affairs and many thanks for the speakers uh, regarding this most inspiring discussion. As we are dealing with uh, technology standardization, for instance, in various uh, platforms, this has been really, really good uh, discussion in, in that regard. But if we maybe look a bit closer at the uh, enabling technologies that uh, many of you already mentioned, um, could you maybe identify let's say, few most uh, crucial ones, maybe like one or two, three bottleneck technologies, which you see as a, as a prerequisite for the metaverse to develop into that uh, vision that we are already uh, having at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Who from the panel wants to elaborate Maybe NTT? Yeah, I think the, the most one is, of course, I think the network. Because for uh, VR and XR, we need high capacity and low latency network. For, uh, for, for example, when we uh, provide uh, interactive uh, virtual rendering service, the network latency should be less than uh, 10 to 20 milliseconds. This is very short. So we need such a network. And you may think that we have 5G, and in future we will have 6G. But to achieve high, band, high capacity and low latency communication, we need to use a very high frequency radio band. And the radio links with such a very high frequency band is very unstable. So it cannot sp support uh, industrial use cases. So that is the challenge, and that would be one of the uh, hurdles for uh, AR, uh, VR uh, realization. I, I will ask Nokia to have some comment on the 6G, because uh, yeah. <laughs> it's very concrete. Okay, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I also have a similar uh, view with uh, Kawashima-san. So um, in accordance to our recent research, uh, we actually analyzed um, you know how traffic actually grows in the future and um, you know uh, of course we have um, you know base baseline um, you know increment of uh, the mobile broadband traffic right but we, at the same time we could also see um, in Excel device uh, generated traffic on top of mobile broadband and then when it compares 
those, you know, uh, the amount of uh, the traffic, uh, which is including mobile broadband plus extra devices. And then uh, we already uh, concluded uh, 5G is not really sufficient. So this is actually starting like uh, 2028 or something. I think 6G-like technology uh, really needed. So that's probably one thing we definitely need to evolve in the future. And uh, so I, I want to just make one uh, comment quickly. So to achieve high bandwidth, uh, low latency radio communication, probably we should consider the closer integration of radio and optical communication. That would allow us to deploy many more uh, radio-based stations and uh, would solve the, uh, the, uh, the quality versus reliability issue. And uh, that's why uh, we are running uh, ION Global Forum, uh, and uh, Nokia is also on the board of directors of ION Global Forum. Yes, and Liberian. I think this is an excellent question from the colleague from uh, from the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. There should be a top five or top ten list of all the the, um, the technologies uh, we or infrastructure enabling infrastructure things we should look at a priority list. Um, uh, that would be something very useful. Just to contribute to this, I mentioned this already. Um, we have a particular experience at Project Liberty of being the stewards of a of a of a protocol. So I think. Again, um, um, I would put on that list um, somewhere the importance of the question, what do we need in terms of public interest infrastructure protocols? That means the enabling infrastructure on top of which businesses build their services, their virtual worlds, their applications. And it is possible to encode in protocols a certain number of ethical standards with regards to how much users can control their data that they share with intermediaries in virtual worlds. Um, how easy or not it is, uh, how centralized or decentralized we want those virt virtual worlds to be. Can users just switch virtual worlds and take with them their assets, um, um, their history of, of engagement, of an action, their social graph, their connections when they go from one to the other? And also, to what extent um, um, users can participate economically in the value creation that is done with the data they share, their neuro data, their interaction data, um, which is incredibly valuable. And um, today, there's no infrastructure that allows all of this. And there is a possibility to think about holistic approaches. And it's a very good moment in the innovation cycle to have those discussions and discuss what is necessary and what are the opportunities. Thank you. Uh, I will have one uh, question from online and then I, uh, next one here uh, on place in Kyoto. Uh, Noli Cristiano asked, considering that industries might want to close the technologies from interoperability and protecting their users to keep engaging in their platforms and not going to the other similar platforms, will interoperability in metaverse be really achieved? Will it be whole interoperable metaverse, or will there be a short of more fragmented or of interoperable metaverse? Will that standardization with the industries achieve this ideal interoperability ideas of vir virtual worlds? Maybe we put meta on the floor. How do you see? Uh, is there room for SMEs to flourish, also smaller? companies yeah. to join, or is it via meta platforms, or is it uh, alongside? Yes, thank you for that question. It's it's something I tried to touch upon earlier in my remarks, but to that question, is it really possible? You know, from our side, we truly believe that there cannot be gated off experiences. So Kathy Lee to me, need thumbs to up. Seamlessly navigate the different experiences in the metaverse. So the idea is that just like you go and browse the, the internet today freely, you'll be able to do the same thing in the metaverse. Of course, it will take a lot of multi-stakeholder cooperation and understanding to build this. This is why, as I was explaining earlier, we really think that there should be an agreement on the foundation of common technical standards, which will allow for that to happen. Um, so that agreement on the baseline interoperability that will connect the metaverse together is really crucial. And you obviously need the right people at the table to, to make that happen. But for us, that is something we, we believe in. Um, to the question from the speaker, 
we we don't think there should be gated off communities it really needs to be a, a seamless experience for the citizen for the small businesses for developers for those who will be using and benefiting from the metaverse and this is why i was explaining you know some of the efforts that we're involved in to to build those common technical standards um and obviously you know it will take a lot of effort it will take a lot of expertise sharing it will take involvement from the different stakeholders but essentially it's about lowering lowering barriers to entry and facilitating access by as you're saying small firms by developers by citizens to make sure that it's a it's an inclusive space so from our perspective yes absolutely there should be um that kind of an agreement on common technical standards to allow for the metaverse to be truly interoperable and inclusive um but the of course, urban still, base has left the meeting still in the process of getting there it, it will take time so from our side please feel free also to to count on us and include us in any of these discussions but at the very core of our belief that's that's essentially the vision um that we have so from our side yes absolutely but of course the devil is in the detail as always Thank yeah, you. Patrick, can I comment as well? Oh, of course, please. Uh, yeah. So Lee. first of all, I, I do want to point out that um, interoperability is not just a technical issue. It's not just a burden of the of hardware developers. Um, interoperability at the end of the day won't be enforced only by standards, technical standards. It will be banned large by market, um, uh, market uh, factors, by economic incentives. Uh, I think one of the speakers pointed out earlier, when it comes to standards bodies, though there are always multiple standards competing with each other. And, and eventually the ones who, who win might be the one that works with uh, market um, economics better than, than others. Um, and then also in terms of interoperability, like I said, it's not just technical interoper interoperability, which already encompass you know, different uh, infrastructure requirements, uh, data privacy and security, identity and onboarding, asset ownership, payments, all of this technical uh, interoperability needs to be worked out. Uh, again, both through, you know, kind of a standard setting process, but also market, um, uh, watch out for the market signals. And then uh, also we're talking about usage interoperability. Uh, that is about, you know, how do we actually design and this might more be on the uh, the, the shoulders of uh, hardware and software uh, and infrastructure um, developers. And because here we're talking about how do we make sure that the design and the collaboration is global, uh, you know, for the hardware and software developers to keep that in mind from the very beginning, because different regions, you know, from Europe to Africa to Asia may, first of all, have such, you know, um, differences in terms of access to compute, uh, access to, to networks. So all of those need to be taken into uh, consideration. Designing across also uh, demo um, uh, demographics, like you said, uh, Nepetra, the uh, how children use, you know, the next iteration of the internet will be quite different from adults. So how do we make sure we can uh, actually, you know, um, verify identity and, and hold all of the uh, players uh, involved uh, accountable. That will be one of the key issues when when it comes to uh, ensuring use, usage uh, um, uh, usage and interoperability. And then finally, also the jurisdictional interoperability. Again, like the the data um, free flow issue that I was uh, uh, addressing earlier, that uh, Japanese government has been championing for years, and, and the forum is also involved. That is also important when it comes to interoperability. Uh, it's about data compliance, uh, transacting and creating uh, accountability, and most importantly, identity framework. What construct as our digital identity? How how do we make sure that that's uh, properly protected and guarded? Is it only linked to certain companies and technology uh, owners, or can we actually achieve the, the kind of decentralized uh, identity framework? So. Just to sum up, the interoperability is not just only technical. We do need to look at it from uh, multiple perspectives, which again, our work has touched on. And so I encourage you all to, uh, to, to look up the work that we've done already. I have next speaker here, but I uh, dare to comment from one aspect that I've uh, been working on the European legislation is the m mentioning data 
you refer to existing uh, or the market power who plays best with the market powers, but then there is accumulation of the data in the hands of you. And then that gives a quite different perspective for developing AI, developing virtual worlds. And it was mentioned here at least once that uh, how do we, uh, or a couple of times actually, that uh, how can we handle our own data, our own identity. And then it also comes from the companies that how can they have their data, access their own data and use their own data. So that is actually the single puzzle where we built the metaverse is actually handling the data. And we have talked more the ways to handle, the techniques to handle, but then where the data comes from and who has it. But next big uh, question, please, in the in a, in a hall here. Unfortunately, it's uh, behind me. Please. It's okay, oh. it's inspiring. My name is Peter Brook. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Awards, and uh, we are focusing on uh, the impact level of uh, digital innovation. And one of the things which I'm really interested in is uh, regulation as a driver for innovation. Um, uh, Maria Peter, you, you, you were jokingly before saying something about taxing. And um, I think uh, Paul Fellinger was uh, a little bit more differentiating on this. And he said the economic dimensions to make responsible innovation work. So my question would then would be, in give me three good examples of how it pays for businesses in the technology sphere to behave ethically. Because uh, when you were saying, Paul, before, uh, ethics by design, and uh, you have to basically think about these things in advance. And I think um, our friend from the World Economic Forum was very much differentiating the various different kind of complexities, you know, uh, of interoperability. But if you look at this uh, from the side of ethics, then you just really have to uh, start already much, much earlier. And my question then is, what are the economic means and the tools in order to make it work? Thank you. We are running out of time. We may not have uh, all the panel around, but if uh, someone from the panel wants to answer, I, I see you were. Okay, le let's, uh, let's have it for Paul. Uh, please, uh, you give answer on this one. I will go around, give you a one minute, and I will, uh, if you want to conclude something, but if you don't have anything special still to add, please tell me your favorite virtual world app you want to have yourself. Uh, this was an absolutely excellent question, and those are exactly the topics we should discuss. Um, two very quick answers, because we run out of time. Um, one thing to share from the from Project Liberty's town hall yesterday, because somebody asked exactly the same question. There was a discussion, and also in consultations we were having uh, um, before. For this to work, we need a sort of race to the top situation in an ecosystem where users, consumers, business partners and clients can easily switch from one service to the other. The more centralized an ecosystem is, the less there are incentives to behave more ethically. If you look at the car industry, some people might, um, well, Toyotas are also, or Japanese cars are also very um, safe cars, but Volvo is often mentioned as a very safe car, and people want to pay a premium to drive a very safe car. There have been fights on seat belts um, 30, 40 years ago, and resistance from the car industry to, to put airbags. Today, you want to have the safest car, and yes, a side airbag, of course, please, by default and standard. So th this is a concrete example, and but it requires competition in the market. It requires uh, uh, more decentralization than, uh, than some actors say we have today in the digital economy. Um, a second factor is you, you ask for, for very concrete examples. So cars, I think, there's not technology today, but I give you another example. It makes no economic sense today anymore to build very polluting businesses. It's just too expensive. Nobody would do this. Clients would not buy the products, and, and it just, economically speaking, um, uh, makes no sense today to do this anymore. So the question is, how can we create similar market conditions for a digital economy that is both highly performing, but also puts the right incentives in place uh, through economic means? 
Paul, do you have uh, something that you want to experience in the vir virtual yes. world? Heart was mentioned here, the, well, the education and I'm seeing the heart from inside. And education is <laughs> amazing. I think um, uh, um, I'm particularly excited for, for the notion um, um, also of public service provision um, um, mm -hmm. through virtual services. Um, I think this could streamline a lot of things and make the life better for a lot of people. And I'm very excited. I'm not a doctor myself, but as, as, uh, as the son of doctors, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about what it can do to train uh, medical professionals in the future um, mm. um, through metaverse applications and I think we will make amazing progress and also doing surgeries uh, cross borders virtually um, and don't I take it all don't take it all there's colleagues <laughs> well, um, there are a lot of uh, yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of exciting things uh. Nokia do you have any in mind where you're gonna see virtual world application in 2028 on 6g? Um, well, yeah, actually, um, yeah, there are, st I think, kind of the many virtual applications uh, we predict. Uh, for instance, um, you know, good example is, I think, um, kind of the innovations of um, uh, telepresence. So today, uh, when I think you joined um, online conference, mm. you could only see, you know, the people, you know, just the videos, right? And uh, we cannot really feel like uh, we are in the same meeting rooms. Yeah. But uh, I think in the real future, we could uh, feel as if we are in the same meeting rooms and sharing the experience. Uh, and this can be um, you know, accomplished by you know, capturing uh, where we are right, more precisely in high resolutions and then making some representations in the virtual environment. And uh, we could also see um, you know, where, you know, light is really coming and so forth, as if, you know, we are in the same environment, right? So yeah. this is uh, something uh, in the future of um, telepresence or virtual conference. So I think this now, is about... Now we have Kathy and, and uh, Alexandra, two-dimensional. Would you then join us uh, added reality without ha bearing a heavy glasses on, <laughs> on next time? Or something Possibly. else you want to... Pick up, Cassie, yeah. please. I actually wanted to echo just a comment you made earlier, Petro, which is absolutely key, data ownership. And I agree with you, that is not something that you want only uh, determined by market power, nor that can only be achieved uh, solely through uh, regulations and policy. Because let's not forget, <clears throat> we as users, we usually opt for convenience. So that is a part where you do need business to actually innovate and come up with real good uh, use cases. Um, otherwise, if the, the setup, the business concept is too complicated and no one will use it, then again, we won't be able to achieve the goal of truly you know, decentralizing data ownership to back to, back to uh, human beings ourselves. So I do think that is the most key question now also with generative AI everything always come back to data ownership. I do think that needs to be worked on both from the policy front, but also from business, um, uh, from market perspective as well. Um, so yeah, I want that to be my concluding words. And in terms of virtual worlds, I study all of them, but I actually don't spend much time in it. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I enjoy your comment on the, on the data as well. I still try to not to use data ownership, but access SIP uh, for the data. Then, uh, Alexandra, very short comment. We are lagging behind the time schedule. I see people going past me already. Yeah, and I'm happy to give people time back. But to your question about the applications, I think obviously there are many, many applications. For me, the most uh, exciting ones that I'm seeing currently, and this is already happening, is in healthcare training, um, especially around surgery training. It's very exciting. We we have some discussions with surgeons who are already using the technology. It's incredible what it can do. And secondly, immersive education. Like I, I would love for my son to be able to learn physics and, and history in a much more immersive way than, than I did from a textbook. Uh, so that for me would be the two very exciting applications. But of course, there are many other applications already being explored, for instance, in um, manufacturing and many others. But I'll, I know we're out of time, so I'll let people get to their coffees. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, then uh, we have uh, two panelists here. Uh, thank you for Dr. Kara Washima, who left. Or, uh, oh, no, 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 actually, uh, Bitanga Demo, he, he had to go, but he already mentioned having the hard uh, 
three-dimensional, looking inside, seeing it pumping and so. Elena, um, I can, uh, what would you see as the next application you wanna um, change the universe? No, ICANN is a global organization and we have colleagues around the world, so I would say something very basic, but I'd love to see that. Immersive meetings, being mm -hmm. able to <laughs> communicate with them much easier. And there are people in Australia or New Zealand or what have you. Um, but uh, thank you for this uh, for this session. If I can finish with that, and ICANN's motto, if you will, is is one world, one internet. Everyone said that before. Interoperability is key. So I would expand that a little bit and say, let's make sure we have one world, one internet, one interoperable metaverse, or several, as long as they're interoperable. Thanks. Yes, and finally, Dr. Masa Hisha Kawashima, where would you My enter to the virtual world? Uh, of course, uh, training and education would be very promising, but if I could meet uh, my past, uh, gran my late grandparents and my parents, that would be very nice. Imagine uh, building as from the images. Thank you so much, all the panelists and uh, active participants, and also audience online. Thank you so much. There will be some uh, elements for virtual worlds we want, uh, based on the work from IGF here, and then also done in so many organizations that it's hard to keep on track already. But it's uh, meaning that we are working on the better future. Thank, thank you for my behalf. Thanks, Sarah.